Thank you. It, it is a real special pleasure to be giving uh, to be giving uh, this talk here. I've never talked in this department before, um, and as a Tucson native, it's just really great. Um, thanks for everybody for coming. Uh, so what I want to do is basically do exactly what Andy talked about, which is talk about probabilistic knowledge and human language comprehension and production. Um, and I, I like to, whenever possible, I like to start my talk with some kind of uh, talking piece picture. And this, this is a scene from Great Expectations. Um, it's an illustration from the, some of the original illustrations of Great Expectations, a wonderful book by Charles Dickens, uh, which I recommend to everybody if you haven't read it. Um, if you have read it, uh, this is an illustration of the scene where the protagonist, this young child, um, is introduced uh, by, uh, by this sort of lawyer guy to um, uh, his, uh, to what he believes is his wealthy benefactor who has uh, smiled upon the child and decided to grace, uh, grace the child with um, a great expectation. Um, and expectation in the time of Charles Dickens had more, has a, had a sense that was a little different than what it means uh, today. So back then, expectation also had a meaning of, um, it was basically uh, a, uh, a, um, an inheritance that you would receive in the future. Okay, um, and, uh, but in this case, I think that it, it, there's actually a double meaning of the term expectation um, because by virtue of discovering that, this, this child discovering that he has this expectation, he himself forms certain expectations. Um, and not to spoil the plot, but later on in the book, the child gets surprised. So there's a very appropriate, um, you'll see there's a very appropriate illustration for this talk. So um, uh, let me actually just um, go to start uh, with a description of sort of the top level um, issues that uh, that I think need to be laid out in order to understand what is the, the real framework in which um, I'm working. So um, what I want to start off with is something that I think every, all of you in the room don't need to be persuaded of too, too much since you all work on language, which is that online sentence comprehension is hard. There's, um, there's ambiguity rife in language. Our environment is noisy. We have incomplete knowledge of the person we're talking with. Um, and our attention is limited, our memory is limited, and so forth. Um, that's why, for example, although speech technology, natural language processing is making great strides, it still falls, falls very far short of human level performance. On the other hand, uh, we know that, well, the technologies are improving, and more importantly, we know that, um, that we as humans more or less are incredibly successful in ling linguistic communication. By and large, we understand either exactly what is the intended message of what each other is saying, or something relatively close at the level of, of sentence level intended message. Um, how do we do this successfully? Um, the best theory is that we do this successfully by bringing to bear the, mu the wide range of information sources that are available to, um, to successfully disambiguate and infer intended meaning from overt form. Um, and uh, because and so what are those kinds of knowledge sources? Knowledge of our grammatical properties of the language that we speak. Um, uh, that is, what syntactic structures are available, what lexical items have what categories, subcategorizational preference of lexical items. Also, extra-linguistic knowledge, such as, um, such as real-world plausibility, the plausibility of different kinds of real-world events. Um, knowledge of our interlocutor, what might a person be trying to achieve by uttering a certain sentence. Um, all of these are relevant information sources for interpretation. And because of that, we can say that I want to lay out what rational means. Um, rational, uh, I'm going to mean uh, in this talk to be the idea that since we have a hard task that can actually be solved by the deployment of a wide variety of information sources, it would be rational for people to use all the information available whenever possible. And one of the specific manifestations of rationality in sentence comprehension is the idea of incrementality. Okay. And incrementality is that you don't wait to process any bit of input. Every bit of input is rapidly assimilated into uh, an incrementally evol into a, a, an interpretation that is evolving from the beginning of when we hear somebody speak to uh, to the end. And we have lots of evidence that people do this often. So perhaps one of the best examples of this is um, the work uh, uh, in the, the groundbreaking work in the visual para world paradigm, where we see that a simple sentence like put the apple on the towel in the box, which is locally ambiguous at the phrase on the towel, which could either be the modifier of, of apple, which is locative describing where the apple is, or it could be the goal argument of put. That ambiguity is reflected in eye movements, but also in a very fine conjunction with 
the visual display. So in this case where we have only one apple and two towels, um, at the point of on the towel, there, the eye movements are very rapidly, quite often, sent from the unique apple, which has just been mentioned, to the empty towel, indicative of the, of the interpretation of this potentially as a goal argument, um, rather than what it turns out to be ultimately is a, log, is a noun phrase modifier. Um, how do we know that that's a misinterpretation? We can compare it with a condition in which there are two apples, one of which is, which is on a towel, one of which is not, and we find that these eye movements, which turn out to be ultimately to what is not uh, even relevant for the, um, for the task, which is to physically move an apple into the box, those eye movements disappear and rather people look in between the two apples and then ultimately look to the final box locative goal. Um, and if you start to think about all of the information sources that are being integrated here, real-time application, so obviously speech recognition of, of individual words, real-time application of syntactic knowledge, constructing the two alter alternative interpretations, the, um, the world knowledge about, um, uh, about, uh, about what can be put in what kind of object, um, visual environmental knowledge, and also pragmatics, why somebody would use on the towel or why they might not use it in a situation where there's only one apple versus two, and towel, being on the towel is or is not a useful discriminative property. So this is, I, I think, one beautiful illustration of it. Another beautiful illustration is the famous garden path sentence, um, such as, uh, as was groundbreakingly, um, groundbreakingly demonstrated here, uh, the, the famous sentence, the horse raced past the barn fell. Um, and uh, just a very brief review of this, I'm sure that nobody needs extensive review, but what's going on here, this is a confusing sentence because there is a very attractive analysis of the sentence where the word raced is the main verb of the sentence preceded by the noun phrase subject, the horse. Um, that turns out ultimately to be the wrong analysis. Instead, there is a reduced relative analysis that is correct, um, where the entire phrase, the horse raced past the barn, is the subject of the sentence and fell as the main verb. Um, and so this distracts you so badly from the ultimately correct interpretation, you generally can't even get the ultimately correct interpretation without years of linguistic training. Um, in case years of linguistic training were not enough, this sentence should mean the horse that was raised past the barn fell. Um, but this is not purely driven by syntactic knowledge, real world factors such as um, uh, plausibility of events and so forth, argument structure preferences can completely change interpretive preferences so the evidence examined by the lawyer was unreliable, does not elicit the same kind of garden path and behavior. Um, what do we know about this about these, this situation? People fail to understand these kind of strong garden path sentences most of the time, and people are likely to misunderstand it. Things like what might say, "What's a barn fell?" Oh, you mean the horse that raced past the barn fell? Oh, you mean the horse raced past the barn and fell? Um, I'm gonna. So, so this is one of the kinds of benchmarks in sentence processing. Um, we actually know a lot about this. We know a lot less about this, and I could give a whole talk on what I think this is about, but that, that would be another talk just to sow the seeds. Um, so what was this, what is, um, how can we think about ambiguity resolution? Garden pathing is a hallmark of ambiguity resolution where we am disambiguate in one direction and if we're devious enough as researchers, we can, show, we can find situations in which people discover that they're dramatically wrong. Um, well, it turns out that probabilistic grammars from computational linguistics are a very effective way of modeling ambiguity resolution, um, both at the incremental and global level in psycholinguistics. So um, what are probabilistic grammars? They're things like this. So let's take a, a, an impossible input sentence. A probabilistic grammar is simply a regular context-free grammar. This is a probabilistic context-free grammar, which is going to be a real workhorse uh, for everything I talk about in today's talk. Um, and they're simply context-free grammatical rules that are, that are adorned with probabilities ranging between 0 and 1, subject to the constraint that for every left, every possible grammatical symbol, the sum, if it's a non-terminal, the sums of the probabilities of all the rules that rewrite that symbol have to equal to one. Okay, um, that that is uh, that's a, the constraint that makes it a wealth that makes it what's called a proper probabilistic grammar. They're used in just sort of in a nutshell in the following way: you take a probabilistic grammar, you take a sentence, you churn through some kind of algorithm that gives you possible structures. For example, this is a possible structure for one sentence. And you look at the probabilities, and you take the product of the probabilities, and you get the joint probability of the structure and the sentence. And you can do things like, uh, you can do things like for example, disambiguate um, by looking at, given the, set, given the str string, what are the likely tree structures and the unlikely tree structures. You can also crucially do, um, uh, you can also crucially do incremental prediction, and I'll talk about that in a moment. 
So um, for the horse race past the barn, for example, um, a simple application of this idea was that, and this is what Dan Jurafsky in 1996 showed, um, you could just simply assume, a simple analysis would be assume there are two incremental parses, one a, a reduced, uh, sorry, one a main verb analysis and one a reduced relative analysis. And um, you can use, in his case, he used a combination of phrase structure probabilities and argument structure preferences, the fact that race doesn't like to be a transitively used verb. And he estimated that the probability ratio of these parses would be something along the order of 82 to 1. Okay, so at this point in the sentence, your belief in this interpretation is 82 times more strong than this. And so your bets are going to be very heavily placed on that interpretation. Actually, I would say, um, I would say that that's probably a lower bound on actually the ratio because there are a lot of information sources that are not being taken into account. For example, if um, the horse is going to race somewhere that, be, that doing it past the barn is a really good place to be racing and so forth. There's extra information sources that are not captured in this model. So this is probably a conservative estimate of how, how strongly biased the sentence is. Um, and so Jurowski proposed, his idea was that simply in these situations where you have a very biased probability ratio, that the, the, that the dispreferred analysis, sorry, this should be the um, reduced relative analysis, falls, just simply falls off the beam. That basically you just discard it, discard it because relative to your favorite candidate, it's so unlikely why expend the resources to keep it in memory, okay? So this was a qualitative theory of disambiguation, okay, previous state of the art. Now, enter the problem of how do we quantify, quantify, say, disambiguation difficulty. And here, um, I'm gonna talk about a different idea, which is something that was introduced by John Hale in 2001. Um, and, uh, I thought it was a great idea, so I've worked with it a lot myself. Um, the idea is simply that let's just say, let's just start from scratch and let's say how difficult is a word to process in its context? And let's just explore the idea that the difficulty of a word to process, given its context, the difficulty in integrating it into a, an evolving structural representation is what's called the surprisal in its context. And the surprisal of an event, let's say a, an event like the ith word in a sentence, in the context is defined as the log of the inverse of the conditional probability of that event given the context of the event occurs in. And a simple approximation might be, for example, if you're having people read isolated sentences, then maybe a simple approximation might be that the, um, that the context is, the relevant context is only the previous words in the sentence. So we could reduce this down to it is the probability of the word given the previous words, okay? And um, there's some nice things about this. So um, this captures the expectation intuition in a stronger way that, um, in a stronger way that we don't see uh, in, um, in Jurafsky's work and in her previous work. And that is simply that the more we expect an event, the easier it is to process. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, so brains are prediction engines, okay? So we're in the year, we're in the, what is it, the era of the brain or something like that, by neuroscience. But um, this really is very, I mean, it is incredibly relevant to linguistics. So what I'll do, a simple example of this is, um, I'm gonna give you sentence prefixes, that is beginning of a sentence, and I want you to just think of the word that first comes to mind, hold in your head, and I will try to guess it. So the first example of this is, my brother came inside to, okay, does everybody have a word? Okay, great, so I will try to guess it. So chat, no, wash? Good. It's dry in Tucson. That's what it is. How about get warm? Probably not. Oh, a couple of people. Oh, this is winter, right? Okay, great. So I didn't do too bad there. There are a lot of words in English. I got about five out of however many people are in the room. That's not too bad. So let me try again. The children went outside too. Why, why are you guys laughing? Well, so let me try. Play? Okay. By some mystery, these... Well, hopefully this demonstrates the point that brains are doing prediction all the time. It's actually incredibly hard to stop it. You actually have remarkable, remarkable kinds of insights, actually. Even, even the fact that we do have introspective, the reason you laughed is you had introspective knowledge of your degree of certainty in what was to follow next, okay? And, and this is, um, these are guesses that are based on actually empirically what people will guess. So actually I was, you know, I wasn't lucky this is not a uniform distribution over words either. You know, there's really a very biased distribution here, but it's nothing compared to this, okay? And um, we don't have complete solution as to why this is such a stronger predictive constraining environment than this is, but hopefully that gives you the sense of um, that environments can vary dramatically in these kinds of properties about prediction strength about what comes next. 
So empirically, we've known for a long time that predictable words like play, and, and notice that play could have occurred in this context. So my brother came, in fact, did anybody think play in the first one? Raise your hand if you thought my brother came inside to play. So occasionally people will guess that. Um, there's nothing wrong or anomalous or implausible about that, but it's just not, somehow, it's not strongly predicted. Well, if you take play in this context and in this context, play will be read reliably more quickly in this context. There will be a, a reliable difference in the EEG signature um, of the response to the word play in this context and in this context. And that's, um, reli that's really reliable. So what we can do now to understand, so this is sort of like general whatever kind of knowledge you have. What I want to know is I want to understand two things. So one is the relationship between this expectation intuition and grammar. And two is um, this is not only saying a qualitative expectation intuition that the more we expect an event, the easier it is to process, but there's a quantitative commitment to the nature of how difficulty and increases and decreases with probability. And I want to explore those two things. Okay, and we're going to do that by combining um, this idea of surprisal with probabilistic grammars that I just described before, which I talked before about for ambiguity resolution, but can also be applied to prediction. Okay, um, so what is the surprisal graph? It looks like this. Um, here is surprisal, bits is on the y-axis, sorry, it's got cut off. Surprisal units is bits. Probability goes from zero to one. So an obligatory event that has probability one is totally unsurprising. It might as well have not happened. It communicated no information. That will be relevant later in the talk. Um, as surprisal increase, as probability decreases, um, surprisal increases um, off, as, uh, in increases uh, exponentially, um, asymptoting to infinite surprise at probability zero. Um, fortunately, those things never happen since they have probability zero. That's like, that's maybe one way of thinking about, you know, why do computational linguists always say never put probability zero on everything? Because you don't want to be infinitely surprised. Um, okay, so uh, first, what I want to do is I want to um, I want to show you how uh, surprisal accounts for garden pathing. I'm going to use another example of um, garden pathing, and then I'm going to talk about another domain, the other major domain of sentence processing, and I'm going to show you surprisal has broad coverage in that area too. So here's another type of local syntactic ambiguity. So this is a classic result um, from Frazier and Rayner, 82. When the dog scratched the vet and his new assistant removed the muzzle. Is that confusing? Where is it confusing? Scratched? Sort of early. Oh, and. So one place is and. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and is certainly surprising. Is there any other loci of difficulty? Removed, yes. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So empirically, so the empirical phenomenon that makes this, did anybody find the end of the sentence, by the way, weird? Yeah, so the, uh, there's actually a lot of sites of surprise in this sentence. The one that I'm going to focus on is the word remove, but actually this, has the, this sentence has the interesting property um, that uh, you could be surprised at the end of the sentence, which is another great example of surprisal. The, and there was, there was no, um, you know, there's, the reason that it could be surprising there is that the entire thing could be a subordinate clause. You might not have gotten to the main clause yet. Um, and you'd be surprised by a non-event. You expect an event, you get a non-event. Um, so the reason this is difficult is that the, it's very attractive to interpret this as a S. Uh, actually, this is not an S. This is part of two different S's. This is the main clause S. Okay. Um, so removed is the site of disambiguation. Removed does not fit into this initial interpretation where that's an S. Right. And, and measuring back in the old days, they measured difficulty in milliseconds per character, which I think is actually a wonderful way of quantifying difficulty. It's got the right kind of units. Um, Anyway, so they, they found that, for example, this word was read at, um, it, or in these kinds of sentences, at 68 milliseconds per character, compared with, here are two other alternatives, where either you just insert a comma at the word scratched, or you insert an overt noun phrase um, that actually serves as the direct object. Um, and in uh, this case, for example, uh, it is the, um, the NP here that blocks the, um, the, the misinterpretation of this as an S. And here, for example, this is 50 milliseconds per character. So there's an appreciable difference in difficulty that you can measure that corresponds to syntactic disambiguation, garden path. Not as strong a garden path as the horse trees past the barn fell, but a fairly strong garden. This is taken as a generally pretty strong garden path. So how do we model this in surprisal? Um, here is a small probabilistic context-free grammar. This is a toy grammar, and I'm using this to just illustrate the qualitative kind of stuff that matters, and then I'll show you a non-toy grammar result. Um, so this is a grammar that does the things you need to do for these kinds of sentences. It has uh, 
complement clauses. Um, it, it can have commas at the end of a, of a sentence initial subordinate clause. Sorry, I should say subordinate clauses. It can have um, commas or not at the end of a subordinate clause. It has coordination and noun phrases. It has transitive and transitive verbs and so forth. Um, this is going to be relatively crucial. Um, and if you plug this grammar in, if you just turn the crank of any standard incremental processing algorithm, you find that there's a garden. This is the garden path analysis where scratch the vet and his new assistant is a verb phrase, um, and the dog scratches the vet and his new assistant is a is a sentence. Um, uh, and and this is just the stuff that's obligatory within this toy grammar given this point in this analysis. And you can calculate using uh, Bayes theorem the conditional probability of this analysis given the preceding context up to the, the, the string up to assistant. Here's the other ultimately correct analysis up to the word assistant. This has a low probability. Um, and well, now what's the surprisal of this word removed? So the question is going to be how likely is each of these analyses to generate the word removed? And um, probability theory tells you that in pure surprisal where the only thing I said is that the probability of a word is the, in its context is what determines difficulty. Well, what is the role of structure? The role of structure is it is a latent variable that the, that the reasoner is inferring in the process of guiding their, um, guiding their understanding of the sentence. In probability theory, when you have multiple possible structures and you need to determine the probability of something in the future that depends on that structure, what you do what's called marginalizing, which is you take the weighted average of the strength of predictions of each of these analyses for the next word and the weights of the belief levels of the word at, at, the, at that point. So in this case, there are two, there are two analyses so the marginalization looks like this. The probability of the word removed, given the context, is the marginal probability averaging over all of these structures, T, of the probability of the word given the structure times the probability of the, stru the structure given the preceding context. So these are the weights. These are the prediction strengths. And when you do this for only two analyses, you find that there is one probable analysis which is strongly weighted. Sorry, I have these backwards compared to this. So this is. This is the probability of the tree given the preceding context. But this tree cannot give rise to the word um, removed because it needs a noun phrase next. It, it has to have a noun phrase before it has a verb phrase. Okay, This tree can give rise to the word removed. It, has, it, it says, I want a verb next. But it's an unlikely structure. So you're always multiplying a large thing and a small thing together. And you're taking the sum of those things. And when, because you're multiplying a small thing in every time, you can never get a large thing. So that means it's always going to be unpredictable. And if we compare that to um, the case where, for example, you have an overt uh, noun phrase that blocks the lower um, the, the misinterpretation, you can compare the surprisal at the word removed in the in the disambiguity NP absent versus present conditions, and you can see that not having that noun phrase at the beginning costs you 2.2 bits. Okay, so 2.2 bits of surprise. Um, now, interestingly, more recently, Adrian Staub has revisited these um, kinds of structures, and he found something really interesting. So here is a superficially simple example. When the dog arrived, the vet and his new assistant removed the muzzle. How is this different? Right, so arrived is obviously different. Removed is no longer so hard. You could say, well, you were primed by me, but no, actually, it's empirically not as hard. So there are two changes when we compare it to um, the previous example. It's easier here, but there's actually something else that goes on. Does anybody have an intuition as to what that is? It's actually harder here than scratched. And you ask, why is that the case? So this is the comparison sentence. Well, I, the intuition I would say is, well, we just expect that the word, we don't expect to get a noun phrase at that point. Okay, Arrived is not something to take the noun phrase complement. Um, so this grammar does not have the property of distinguishing different kinds of verbs. So this grammar on its own cannot do that, uh, cannot make that distinction because the probabilities, the way that the rules are stated creates what's called conditional independence between the identity of a verb and the, um, the phrasal category sisters of the verb. Okay? That is this version of the PCFG. However, that is not an architectural limitation of PCFGs. You can do, there's a, a long literature in computational linguistics of what's called relaxing probabilistic locality. So for example, introducing a difference between transitive and intransitive verbs in the, into the grammar. So we can split up the verbs into transitive and intransitive types. And once again, we don't want to apply probability zero to anything because we could be infinitely surprised. But we can have sort of a soft transitivity where it's much more likely for a quote unquote transitive verb to have an empty complement 
than it is not to, and vice versa for intransitive verbs. Okay, once we do this, it turns out by making the, just injecting this piece of knowledge, you get a really interesting result, which is that both of the both of the differences in the two sentences, both of the ambiguity onset and of the ambiguity resolution, pop out. That is that um, if we look at the transitivity distinguishing PCFG, in the intransitive situation, um, you have greater, um, in, in the intransitive arrived case, you have greater surprisal at the onset of the ambiguity than you do in the transitive case. So V is more surprising here than it is here. But you have the reversal at the word removed. Okay, so it's more surprising with scratched than it is with arrived. And that's basically, you can sort of think of that as you paid the cost of disambiguation to the correct interpretation here early on. You don't have to pay it here. Okay, that works out mathematically and it works out empirically. Um, you may say, well, that's a toy grammar. So here's um, a broad coverage grammar from the Parse Brown corpus, which is one of the standard tree banks, uh, broad coverage tree banks of, um, uh, of syntactically annotated English. Um, I took basically, this is the most simple way of estimating rule probabilities with one exception. I just introduced the transitivity distinction I showed you before. And interestingly, what you get is you get a qualitative and not too bad quantitative match at both the onset of the ambiguity. So high here is that uh, upward is that scratched, the scratched version is hard, and down is, is arrived is hard. And you can see that at the onset of the ambiguity at the vet, arrived is harder than scratched, but it reverses at the offset of the ambiguity, the ambiguity resolution, when scratched is harder than arrived. Okay, and so you get a pretty nice qualitative fit throughout this interesting region of this, this kind of sentence. Okay, so that first part was about, um, that was a part about <coughs> ambiguity resolution and surprisal, okay? I wanna now go on to uh, the other, so an ambiguity resolution, largely speaking, is one of the two major fields of sentence processing. The other major field is what's called syntactic complexity, okay? Which is, in the absence of ambiguity, how difficult are different, different kinds of syntactic configurations to process? And um, Historically, the dominant view about syntactic complexity has been what I'll call a resource limitation view. Um, and uh, maybe the most recent uh, prominent incarnation of resource limitation views is, is work by Ted Gibson in the late 1990s and early 2000s, what's called the dependency locality theory, DLT. And the theory is really quite simple to grasp. The idea is that when you hit, when you hit a particular word, you complete all the dependencies between that word and stuff preceding it that you can't the more such dependencies you have to complete, and the farther back the dependencies reach, the harder it is. That's, that's the whole theory. So, and, and it's, a, it's a neat theory, and it gets a lot of things um, right. So for example, here's a subject extracted relative clause. Now, this is probably something also, this phenomenon is probably familiar to many people. The reporter who attacked the senator. In this case, attacked has two adjacent dependencies, and they come in one at a time. So you're never simultaneously doing multiple dependencies, and every dependency you do is a short distance. Because of that, this is a relatively easy kind of relative clause in dependency locality theory. On the other hand, the reporter who the senator attacked, the object relative clause, here, both of the, both of the dependencies attacked come in at the same time, and one of them is strictly farther in this sentence than it was in the subject relative clause. Because of that simultaneity and greater distance, this is a harder dependency configuration to process for dependency locality theory. Well, it turns out that there's a general there's a general situation that allows you that the, the expectation based theories that I've been talking about up till now interestingly diverge from resource limitation theories like this in a rather systematic set of syntactic configurations. What is that set of syntactic configurations? So suppose you're in the following situation. There's some event class X. So for example, that could be syntactic category of verb. And you know that it has to occur in the future, but there's two things you don't know. You don't know first, when is X going to occur? When in the sentence is it going to occur? And the other thing you don't know is which member of X is it going to be? So for example, there are many different verbs. And the things you see before X, so we'll call those things W, those can give you hints about these two things, okay? Um, and Expectations tell you, in fact, there is a theorem of information theory that if surprisal is the right metric of how difficult incremental processing is, then on average, these things can never hurt you. And the reason that, the, the basic theorem is that, is that you can never, entropy can never, um, can never increase 
uh, with more information. As you, as you accumulate more information in your context, entropy can never increase. It can only decrease. So it should never be able to hurt you, and in general, it should help you. However, from the resource limitation point of view, you have to keep these things in memory, right? And, and that could slow processing in X because you have to retrieve them and integrate them all together at once. So for example, um, it might be this kind of configuration, something along these lines, where you have either fewer or more kinds of things that precede, say, a verb, where you don't know when the verb is going to happen until you get to it, and you don't know what the verb is going to be. So what happens, and, and, and uh, we can ask, so what happens, for example, in German final verb processing? So um, and this turns out to be very interestingly different from the English situation. So um, here is an example of um, Three of, this is an example of a study by me and Frank Keller um, uh, that that we can that, that we actually studied um, we studied this kind of uh, this kind of configuration. So this is a fairly com complex um, uh, this is a fairly complex kind of situation. So this is the insight that the friend. Oh, I'm sorry. This is sorry. This is a different example. This is this is work by um, Lars Kenyetsi. I'm sorry. I was thinking of a different sentence. So this is work by Lars Kenyesny and his collaborator um, Philip During. So this is the insight that the that the friend sold the car to the client, the plastic car to the client, and used the others. Okay. And the relative th relatively important thing here is that there is a relative clause introduced, and then there's a bunch of pre-nominal, pre-verbal dependencies, and then there's this verb sold at the end. And, and German, as you know, has many environments where verb finality is obligatory. And so you're in this whole time in, in this intermediate space, you know that you're expecting a verb, but you haven't gotten it yet. Right? So the question is, well, what, is all this inter what does all this additional material do? So Konietzny did something very, very clever. So he took this kind of example, the insight that the friend to the client, the car sold, and then he just changed one letter. This is, um, so this is a three dependency case. If we just ignore everything outside the relative clause for simplicity and comparison, this is a three dependency case. Just change one letter, M to S, and that creates a generative case rather than a dative case, and it means that you have one left dependency because this is now a post depend, uh, this is now a preceding, a following dependent of this noun phrase. It is a genitive modifier. Okay? And so here you get, um, uh, you get two predictions. So locality based theories say that the final verb should be read faster in the des condition because you have fewer dependencies. What you find, though, is the opposite. It's actually the final verb is read faster in this condition. So it's an anti, what's called an anti-locality effect. Okay. So this is one of the first demonstrations of what are now called anti-locality effects. So we can ask the question, of, well, what does surprise do in these kinds of situations? And we get some very interesting answers. So I'll show you, um, um, the, I think the way to think about it is to think of the possible space of events of, uh, in the class X that um, that could occur. Okay, so for in this case, we you know we there are many. Once you get into this um, uh, this this sentential complement context, um, you are in a situation where you have some expectations about what is the next syntactic phrase type that you're going to get next. Okay, so for example, that the friend where the friend is nominatively marked. A lot of things could happen next. You could get an accusative noun phrase. You could get a dative noun phrase. You could get some kind of preposition. You could get an adverbial. You might get the verb next. Now, what happens next? So here, depending on the dependency structure, so one important thing about these level verbal dependence is that they're often in a relationship of you can't have, you don't want to have more than one of the same type. It's unusual, for example, to have more than one accusatively marked noun phrase. It can only happen in special cases. It's unusual to have, say, more than one locative goal, for example. Um, and so um, by virtue of seeing a dative noun phrase, you can sharpen your expectations away from dative noun phrase as the next kind of up syntactic, upcoming syntactic event and sharpen them toward all the other possibilities. Likewise, this will also create a sharpening of expectations about the kind of verb you will see if you see a verb next. And this will continue. Um, you'll get narrow expectations in both cases from this accusative verb or this accusative noun phrase. So when you get the verb now, you're actually in a case where you have more narrowly circumscribed expectations toward it in this situation because you've ruled out more possibilities than you have in this case because you've seen more constraints on the preverbal dependency structure. That both narrows down what's going to happen next and what element, and, and if you see the verb, what verb might it be. If we just actually, even the, even the first example alone, the first kind of information alone, what's going to happen next, um, gives you the qualitative result that um, I've been talking about. That qualitative result is that in the dative condition, where you had shorter reading times, you have higher 
conditional probability, and therefore the surprise will be lower than in the general And once this is a lower, not even incorporating the constraints on what the verb identity might be, which is a much harder thing to model. But you get you would get an amplification of this effect. Okay, so this show this is just one of many examples, and I, you can ask me for more kinds of examples about this. Where you will get. Um, You'll get conflicting exam conflicting. You can set up syntactic configurations where surprisal and memory-based theories make opposite predictions. So this is complexity. There was no ambiguity in terms of the analysis of the th string thus far in these kinds of sentences. There's nothing that is a predictable. Um, so now I want to go back to the second thing that I talked about, which is the commitment to the quantitative relationship. That is, is surprisal the right metric of expectation? Maybe you're convinced that probability. And I have worked on that. Um, and uh, how do you do that? So, in order to do this, you can't use the same kind of methods of and trials, and then try to figure out the result because you need very large amounts of data to do something like infer the correct shape of a curve. Um, how do we do that? We're going to use it as a proxy for you know, hypothetically what we're interested in processing difficulty. We'll we'll look at as we have before at reading time, and we'll use both self reading and eye tracking as two different methods. The two standard reading measures used in the, uh, ways of doing reading in the literature. Um, and the challenge once again is that we need big data to estimate curve shape. Uh, and not only is it hard because we want to actually pin down the curve shape, but also probability for surprisal is going to be it's going to be correlated with other factors, right? So for example, the simplest one is that. The frequency of a word is actually its average probability, right? So therefore, higher frequency words are going to be more probable, period. Well, we actually know that high frequency words are easier to process independently because of isolated word recognition studies. And furthermore, we act they actually have a fairly systematic shape. The, the relationship between a word frequency and its difficulty to recognize actually is quite systematic. Um, another one is length. You know that more frequent words tend to be shorter. So th therefore, probability and frequent and length are also correlated. So this is a case of kind of multiple regression. So it's a multiple regression problem, but it's a not it's a different special kind of multiple multiple regression problem because we have to recover the shape of a curve. Just to give you a sense of the challenge, um, but the possibility of surmounting the challenge in terms of the correlations. So here's for we did this uh, with a very large eye tracking corpus with relatively small number of subjects, where there was a huge amount of data per subject, 50,000 words, and we did it. Um, but but only 10 subjects, and then we did it on the brown corpus, which has a far fewer. We did it, sorry, on a subset of the brown corpus that we collected using cell-based reading, where we have far more subjects in the 30s, but we have far fewer words per subject. And what you can see is this is this is surprisal and this is log frequency. Sorry, this is negative surprisal and this is log frequency. Um, and what you can see is that there's obviously a correlation. But if you focus in the upper right-hand corner of these graphs in the upper right-hand corner, there is still a fair amount of spread. So big data does actually work even for substantially correlated cases like this. So what do we do? We used a non-parametric regression technique called generalized additive models. And what we looked at is um, the total contribution of word log probability to reaction time. And uh, what we found is that, that that contribution over six orders of magnitude, so this is effectively from nearly obligatory events, right? Like um, you know, the children went outside to play to one in a million events, which you might ask, how do you get one in a million events? Well, Zipps law tells you there are many one in a million events that you will encounter, even though no particular one in a million event is likely. Over six orders of magnitude like that, we see that the relationship is basically linear in both methods. The, and in fact, you actually see that the quantity of difficulty is uh, over the six orders of magnitude is quite comparable. Um, it's a little less in I tracking than in self-paced reading, but that actually wouldn't be that strange because self-paced reading is unnatural. Eye tracking is more natural, so maybe it's just a little harder to do self-paced reading. Um, but in terms of, you know, the by and large, these are the same curve, and they're by and large linear. They're more or less linear. These are 95% confidence intervals, so you can see, you know, how how um, how important the little squiggles may be. I mean, you can easily pass the straight line through both of these. Um, okay. So summary of surprisal theory. So what surprisal is? It's a simple theory of um, how linguistic knowledge guides expectation formation and online processing. What, are, what do we get out of it? Well, it unifies ambiguity resolution and syntactic complexity. Those have historically been relatively different fields. 
in sentence processing. But what we have here is we have one theory that really covers, it, it can cover both kinds of phenomena. Now, I'm not going to pretend that there are no problem spots for surprisal, and you can ask me about that if you're interested. Um, it doesn't cover every single phenomenon that we can find, but it covers a very bright sw a broad swath with a very simple theoretical set of commands. Um, and it covers uh, very different kinds of findings as well. So it covers garden path ambiguity resolution. It, co it covers even simple lexical things that don't have to do with syntax, like the children went outside to play. It covers things like um, these verb, uh, verb final structures and how difficult they are to process. And particularly, those are cases where the memory-based theories didn't do well. OK. Um, so let's see. So I'm, I'm, if I'm aiming for an hour, I have about 15 minutes left. So is that right? I'm going to. I'm going to actually skip the next section and go on to, uh, I want to talk about the relationship with production. So how do I get up to that? Uh, oh, it's over here. Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, somehow I should, oh, that's it. OK, so I want to relate this to, I said I was going to talk about comprehension and production. Um, I'm actually just going to jump to the empirical phenomena that I want to start with. So um, let's just start with an empirical phenomenon. Okay? Certain types of relative clauses in English are optionally introduced by a word that seems to be more or less meaningless, the word that. How big is the family you cook for? How big is the family that you cook for? No appreciable difference in meaning. So what governs, and, and this of course is a relative, uh, oh, what is going on with my animation? My animation is not working at all. What if I, Oh, I have to click this? Yes, OK. So this is a relative clause. Modifies the noun family. That's something that's all familiar. Means the relative clause plus the head noun. The meaning of the relative clause is something like you hook for the family. Um, what governs the use of that optional function word that? Okay. Is it random? Why is it there when it's there? Why is it not when it's there, when it's not there? And the idea that I want to promulgate um, for studying this is the idea of uniform information density or sometimes known as the idea of constant entropy. Um, uh, and what the idea is simply, oh, I am, hold on a second, something disappeared. Oh, I do not have that slide. Well, there are markers. So the general idea of uniform information density is that if we think of the rate, if we think of There is another mark over here. Let's try it over here. That's even worse. Oh, here's a third marker. Round three. That's a good marker. OK, so we think of this as time or words. The general idea, and this is surprisal level of the stuff that's coming in. Surprisal measured in bits. So there are two kinds of profiles, right? Now I wish I had two colors of markers. No, I won't do it. So uh, I can do it on just two different graphs here. So this is this is time, word. So there's going to be one that's good, and there's going to be one that's bad. OK, so the idea, oh, thanks. So you just put it here. Well, yeah, this is great. I will use, now I can have a color mapping between good and bad. So I don't have red, but you'll have to guess which one is good. Um, so we have something like this, okay, and then we have something like, something more like that. Okay, and assume that the average for the two is the same. So let's call this the average, and this is y, y not, and this is y not. So the average is the same in both cases, but one of them is going to be good and one of them is going to be bad in terms of comprehension efficiency, communicative efficiency. And the claim of uniform information density is that this is going to be worse than this. And you can, there, actually, under relatively broad uh, sets of assumptions, you can actually prove that if, 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 if a slightly superlinear function of surprisal, for example, is actually the index of processing difficulty. Or, for example, if true surprisal is the index of comprehension difficulty, but it's bad for comprehender and speaker to get misaligned with each other. All of these situations can lead to this being suboptimal relative to this. That is that you want, with each unit of linguistic transmission, whether it's time or words, is something that is open for grabs. Um, the claim is that, that achieving a greater level of uniformity is going to be better. Because I think you can think of it maybe 
one way to think about it might be that it costs resources to process whatever you're getting in. The more surprising things are, the more resources you need. And you need to, if you just constantly allocate a constant set of resources that deals with whatever comes in, that's better than having to modulate how many resources you're using for comprehension of various times. This idea, um, it's appeared, uh, there's a, and that's one view of it. And another one is just sort of appealing to basic precepts of information theory, which basically says that any, um, any communicative channel has a channel capacity. If you go above the channel capacity, you're going to incur communication error. And so you want to sort of push up communication rate up as close to the channel capacity as possible. This idea, previous ideas, in particular the probabilistic reduction hypothesis in phonetic realization, uh, which is things like when do you say the versus the, when do you say uh, uh, versus a. Uh, hypothesis about the duration of syllables, the entropy rate constancy hypothesis about discourse. Um, and what we're doing for the first time, um, this study uh, was the first study that examined a specific linguistic speaker choice variable above the syntactic, above the phonetic level. So it's at the level of lexical choice that implicates, that is implicated by a syntactic event occurring. Okay. Um, oh, and I have to go again here to continue. Um, in order to understand how this theory of uniform information density relates to the choice of optional that, think about what events are being communicated by what words grammatically by the first word in a relative clause without that. How big is the family U? There are two things that the U, word U is doing. One is that it signals that a relative clause has begun. To convince yourself of that, take a moment to try to continue this sentence in a way such that U is not the beginning of a relative clause. Just try to do that for a moment. Can anybody do it? I can do it. How big is the family, you nitwit? But that's probably a low probability kind of continuation. So it's very hard. It's very hard to think. There are only very circumscribed sets of possibilities by which this could be the onset of something. Uh, this could not be the onset of a relative clause. So it's a very strong signal that a relative clause has begun. Furthermore, it signals some information about the contents of the relative clause. It signals that the word, it signals that it's not a subject extracted relative clause because you just saw the subject. And you, it tells you what the subject is. The subject is you, whatever the indexical you points to. Um, what does the word that do in terms of the information that's conveyed? It actually separates out those two things. Now, piece of information number one lives on the word that piece of information number two lives on the word you. So what you've taken is that you've taken the same pieces of information and you've spread them out into a more, uh, into a wider range rather than a narrow range. And the theory is that um, then if you ask, well, how informationally dense would this have been if you didn't use the word that? The more informationally dense it would have been, the more you should prefer to spread out that information by using an extra word. That's the idea. And that's simply because imagine you have some that's in your lexicon, some that's in your communication to distribute. You might as well distribute. You, the best place to distribute them is in the cases that are highly informationally dense, because those are the places you need to push down information density. And you can focus on either one of these two pieces of information, but we're going to focus on phrasal predictability in this study. And the hypothesis is that the larger the information conveyed by number one, the more speakers should tend to use the word that. So that is that phrasal predictability, so if we can quantify how predictable is a relative clause in the context, it should actually correlate with that use. And the less predictable the relative clause would be, the more surprising the, rel the fact of the relative clause is. And therefore, the more likely that should be used by speakers who are modulating information density. Um, so we measure these literally using information theory. And they say that conditional probabilities are what matter. Um, and we're going to use the, um, the switchboard corpus for this. Um, and uh, this was carefully done. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, this, is all, th this part is all joint work with Florian Yeager. And in particular, um, he did all the work on preparing the data set for this. Um, so here's a crude version of the hypothesis test. Okay? This version is where we have, we're going to use a simple trigram probability to ask what is the probability of the first word in the relative clause, that is the word you, given the preceding words, um, for example, the family, in an imagined English in which there are no that's in relative uh, the, in introduced relative clauses. And you 
can think of that as an estimate of the information content of both the fact of the relative clause and the content, the lexical content that the, that the word conveys. So here is negative surprisal. So, so more surprising things go this direction. Less surprising things go this direction. Here is the likelihood of using the word that. And what you can see is a very strong effect. The more surprising the, the first word would be, the more likely you are to use that. It's a very strong effect. There are two limitations with what I show you here, though. This is a graphical representation, and it's helpful because you can sort of get a sense of it. But there are two limitations. One limitation is that I have not separated out phrasal predictability from lexical predictability. Um, and second, uh, I have not controlled for confounds. There could be many confounds. Fortunately, Florian also did a great deal of work on uh, all other control variables for this data set. Um, so, uh, and, and, and so what we did along with those controls is then we had to estimate phrasal predictability. So could this can basically separate out the phrasal from the non-phrasal component. And we did that with a probabilistic model of structural production where we use tree structured representations. We did cool things like we said, well, if you have uh, if you have a nested of complex NP, then there are many places the relative clause could attach to. And that means that we have to marginalize over the position in some complicated formula that has some interesting parameters. And we need to estimate those model parameters. And we estimate them. We're going to estimate those parameters from the data set, not from the that use data set, but just from the general distribution of relative clauses in English, which is independent conceptually from when that is used. Once we do that, we basically, once we think about that, that leaves two separate modeling questions. The first one is, how do we, is finding a phrasal predictability model the probability that a particular phrase will come next? And then the second question is, how do we assess whether phrasal predictability is associated with speaker's behavior in that use? So this is sort of like a machine learning problem and a hypothesis problem. The machine learning problem, uh, and this is, let's do, we don't need that. So here's that two-step problem learning problem. Here is the uh, hypothesis testing problem. For this, we use a big regularized very small parsimonious set of features so we can do statistical inference on feature relevance. Um, uh, and uh, we use also for the prediction model, we use all sorts of features. So this is a pr it's a pretty sophisticated model in terms of co-occurrences. So it's things like, for example, semantically empty words tend to have more relative clauses. So the word things has a lot more post modifiers than um, than, uh, uh, than uh, other uh, things. Are so, sorry, this, the animation got a little bit messed up here. But for example, uh, superlatives, definite articles, elicit 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 um, relative clauses as well. But uh, there's an interesting, oh, you can't read this at all. The interesting thing is, so things in the last really makes you want to have a post modifier. Because like this is one of the last few things. is a very incomplete sounding thing to say. But the, so it sets up a desire for a relative clause, but it can actually be met by many things. It can be met, for example, by a prepositional phrase. So this, this is one of the last few things. This is the last, one of the last few things in the world is not so bad. OK, so all of these things are taken into account jointly in this model. Um, there were a lot of different control factors that we had, uh, including ones that were motivated by the complexity literature, the disfluency literature, even some weird version of the phonological literature on OCP effects, and even the social linguistic literature. And we did some, some uh, statistical analysis. And in the end, we found um, that, indeed, the, the graphical result that I showed you is maintained under these more rigorous conditions where we're only looking at phrasal predictability and we're looking at a wide variety of control factors. In fact, this was such a powerful effect that a lot of the control factors that we thought originally thought mattered a lot for this actually just dropped out of the model altogether. So we were left with um, phrasal predictability is the most, the single most important factor that governs that use in these optional that relative clauses. OK, um, but I'm out of time, and I want to leave lots of time for questions. So uh, let me just conclude. I didn't have time to talk about the other production study. You can ask me a little bit about it if you want. But um, speakers seem sensitive to information density as a pr principle of communicative optimality. Optional function words like that or two, I would have talked about optional two in a different construction if I had more time. They sort of have they have a function as a pressure valve for information flow. So, if a part of the sentence is going to be too informationally dense, inserting an optional function word has the property. If the function word is not super rare, in which case it itself would be surprising, it has the property of lowering the information density locally. And um, so we can ask, well, what are function words? You know, so 
maybe this is um, maybe this is a conflict. Maybe it's not. I think it's actually not a conflict, but it's something I think we should ponder. So, um, you know, our functional our functional words something that emerge as a necessary part of universal grammar, or are they a communicative tool that um, that people employ to achieve communicative efficiency? And is that the reason that they exist? And um, you know, maybe the answer is both. So that's something that's an open question. We can discuss it if you like. Um, I want to just thank my collaborators. Um, I have a general summary, but I'll, I'll, basically, probable uh, the summary. I think that the the title uh, really sums it up. So I want to thank. Um, oh, sorry. There's some collaborators here that are. This is the wrong set of collaborator slides. Sorry. Okay. I want to thank my unnamed collaborators, and I want to thank you for the. Um, for the uh, for for listening to this talk and for being here. Thanks.